amidst the waving cattails and primeval splendor of countless ferns, at the foot of a majestic sand dune, in the very shadow of a massive steel mill, lies the priceless, peaceful wetlands habitat known as Coles Bog. Coles Bog has five miles of trails that skirt the edge of wetland bird habitats, dune forests, and a secluded beach area. There are two small parking lots available to access the trails. In many ways, the seeds for what would eventually become the first national park in Indiana were planted right here. The park is named for the pioneering naturalist and scholar Henry Chandler Coles. Coles was a promising graduate student at the nearby University of Chicago when he first discovered the process of succession, by which plant life like marum grass takes root in the sand and helps coordinate the conditions for larger organisms to grow, ending at last with what he termed a climax formation. There are places you can stand and you can look at where you've got new sand forming at the shore and you can look back and you can see where thousands and in some cases millions of years later the dunes have grown over time and you now have a forested ecosystem. So it's just incredible. You rarely have something like this exist where you can see that kind of a time frame compressed on a spatial scale. Coles also became one of the founders of the modern field of ecology. Coles Bog was one of the places that famous Dr. Henry Chandler Coles came out and would bring many different students from the University of Chicago to teach them about the many different types of plants that live in this ecosystem. His university courses became famous for their camping trips and excursions to the Indiana Dunes, and he introduced scholars from all over the world to this uniquely diverse habitat. As he wrote in 1917, it is not so well known as it should be that the dunes of Lake Michigan are much the grandest in the entire world. Not necessarily the highest, though some of them reach up 400 feet and more above the lake, but more than any other anywhere, our dunes show magnificent and contrasting types of plant life, everything from the bare dunes to magnificent primeval forests. I think the USGS came out with their number of plants being about 1300 plus, species of plants and just being in this 25 acres is absolutely an incredible percentage of plants. It's high because what we have here is uh, some drier sand prairie. We have some, some small open water inclusions. We have a very diverse topography. So we have this whole gradient of species. I mean, we have over 30 species of orchid in 15,000 acres compared to like 15 species in Yellowstone with over 2 million acres. This place here is like this conglomeration of all of these species coming together and some of them barely holding on. So there may be one population in the whole dunes and if that ecosystem is gone, the, all the species with that ecosystem are gone too. So it's very fragile and it's very important that we protect those. Coles took to the work of protecting the dunes with a will. And along with other advocates, he helped form the Prairie Club of Chicago in 1908, dedicated to preserving the dunes. In spite of the efforts of Coles and others, during the first half of the 20th century, the future of Coles Bog was anything but secure. In 1952, Dorothy Richardson Buell, a local teacher and activist, organized a group of women in her home and formed the Save the Dunes Council. There were certain things that they knew had to be done very promptly. One of which was to purchase this beautiful tract of land that had gone up for tax sale. When the park became officially a lakeshore or part of the national park system in the 60s, this land was then donated to the national park. In 1965, Coles Bog was designated as a natural landmark. Given the scientific expertise of the bog's namesake, visitors may be surprised to learn that Coles Bog is in fact not a bog at all. It's a fen and this is due to its alkalinity. So scientifically it is built to be what is considered a fen. Bogs and fens are similar in that they're both peaty wetlands. So in a bog, such as Pinhook Bog, the main water source is precipitation. A fen, on the other hand, the primary water source is from the ground. So a fen is much more nutrient rich and that supports an entirely different community of plants, which is unique and diverse in its own right. In the distance, there's a grove of evergreen trees and it's somewhere out in that zone where the alkaline groundwater is coming up that truly makes this a fen and not a bog. 
A raised boardwalk and trail system runs through the wetlands, offering stunning views of the variety of plants, trees, and birds that thrive here. Overhead, the branches of black oak, red maple, birches, tamarack pines, and white cedars wave in the breeze above far more humble vegetation. We talk about plants, we talk about biodiversity, but we don't even know the biodiversity, the depth of biodiversity that we have here. Someone looks at this and I've gotten often, I drove by this as just a field of weed. And to think that it's this community with over 400 species of just plants, it's pretty incredible. In addition to the beautiful cinnamon fern, one can find hardy, water-loving plants like the appropriately named skunk cabbage. This unique plant's metabolism produces enough heat to melt the snow surrounding it, allowing it to flower even in winter. To do so, it must also attract hardy pollinators that can survive lower temperatures, so it produces a strong odor that lures flies seeking carrion. In the spring, we have the spring ephemerals in the woods, the showy woodland wildflowers that come in. And in the savanna systems, we have mostly the lupine and the cocoon just kind of taking over the system. You get this blend of those late May, early June flowers, like the butterfly wheat. And then when August comes, the asters, the encore, so to speak, of the season. But we have 11 species of Asclepius in Northwest Indiana, 10 of them occurring in the dunes. In here, there's butterfly species. There's a caterpillar I saw a couple weeks ago that only feeds on willow. And it's all over on the willows out here. Well, I see dozens of monarchs in this area. What's unique about this spot is they're down at the beach level, but it's busier. There's more people around there. They might encounter this and really like it because there's no vehicles coming by there. There's hardly anybody walking by here. And so it's a real tranquil place. Traveling through the moist wetlands of Coles Bog, visitors also can spy a stunning array of wild mushrooms and fungi, breaking down fallen trees and branches in the endless cycle of death and rebirth. We're gonna get these, you know, these old trees out of here and clean up the forest. You're like, well, wait a minute. Most of the time, those trees are serving as food for fungus and habitat for things like salamander. If we were to pull up the pine tree, we would see that all of its roots are totally covered in a fungus that basically pulled nutrients out of the soil and trade them to the plant. Things like sugars, things that the plant is really good at making. So if that fungus goes away and there aren't nutrients there that the tree can easily pick up on its own, it's gonna start to suffer. In spite of their beauty, not all of the plants that thrive here are welcome. There are two main species of cattails in northwest Indiana. One is native, the other one has a large range, partly of it is in Europe, and apparently the distant genetics hybridize to form a hybrid that is super weedy and can eliminate almost anything else that grows there. Volunteers, nonprofit organizations, and park staff work tirelessly to preserve this precious habitat through controlled burns and carefully applied herbicides. This ongoing work requires a significant investment of time and financial resources. But the stakes are high. Wetlands across the United States are disappearing, lost to development and agriculture. And these are essential habitats. So uh, there's so many birds that depend on water. Something like three out of four birds uh, need this type of habitat. The National Audubon Society has designated Coles Bog an important bird area, and the park is home to a number of increasingly threatened waterfowl. These include birds like the marsh wren, American bittern, and Virginia rail. One can also find both the little blue heron and black-crowned night heron here, as well as migrating birds like these majestic sandhill cranes. Their mating ritual, included in this stunning display by the male, is truly an extraordinary sight. And it's not just birds that make their homes here. Coles Bog is literally buzzing and crawling with life, from migrating monarch butterflies and colorful dragonflies to amphibians like the four-toed salamander. And they lay their eggs in these grassy, sedgy tussocks above the water, and then the egg hatches and the newly hatched salamander larva, the baby, just does a belly flop into the water. It's the only salamander in Indiana that has four toes on its hind feet. Most salamander species have five toes, like you and, you and I do. Coles Bog sits shoulder to shoulder with one of the nation's largest steel producers, and visitors who hike its trails will see firsthand how this unique habitat coexists in a fragile balance with industry. 
The reason that these places, the national park, the state park, some of the other preserves around here are here is because of the, you know, the great uh, trade-off with the industries. One of the reasons why this area is so important is it, it holds an incredible amount of biodiversity. And uh, to have that uh, still be here is highly valuable. Maintaining this balance and continuing to protect the plant and animal life requires ongoing effort and cooperation. In many ways, the Indiana Dunes National Park started right here, and it is up to all of us to see that the vision of Coles, Buell, and countless others is preserved for future generations. The Indiana Dunes Discovery Trail is an incredible natural treasure, and you are an important part of ensuring its future. When you visit, be sure to follow all posted signs and instructions. Visit indianadunes.com to learn about all of the volunteer opportunities and spend time caring for this fragile environment. In addition to the National and State Park Services, a number of nonprofit agencies work tirelessly to preserve and protect the Indiana Dunes Discovery Trail habitats. Learn more about these important agencies and support their efforts with your charitable contributions. Finally, be a champion for the Indiana Dunes. Stay informed and use your voice to tell the story of this wonderful place. Help ensure that all visitors, the magnificent birds, the migrating butterflies, and friends from around the world can enjoy the Indiana Dunes Discovery Trail for generations to come. Check out the links below to get started.